you. I want to welcome all of you tonight and tell you that a lot of confusion has occurred because Harold Swift was our speaker and for anyone who's coming tonight to hear about tobacco, please come back on November 3rd and we hope that it will take place. But for tonight we have Derricka Smith who grew up in Whateley from part of her high school years or whatever and she's going to show you and tell you a lot that we're all anxious to hear. And afterwards, if any of the members want to know anything about the, the uh, event out in the hall or wherever, I'll tell you. I'm not going to bore the audience with the reports of our uh, Wow, my neighbors Hello. made it. Hi there. Thank you for the call. I felt better after I got your second call. Can you see from back here? Because we're encouraging people to sit up front if they can. OK, Derricka, you're on. Thank Shall you. we all give her a hand? <laughs> My, my father moved us here in 1959, and I was really only here for about five and a half years because I went away to college, but I feel that I grew up in Waitley, although I've lived many other places much longer, but I feel like a Waitley person, and my husband and I moved back here from Maine two years ago, and Delia caught me on the Conway Road somehow and said, come and help us at the Historical Society, and I was happy to do that. I'm a retired librarian and my interest in was, I was a genealogical librarian for many years, so I'm particularly interested in genealogy. So we can get the lights now. And I am going to read, oh shoot. Well, what's, somebody has to help me get that out of there. I guess I can just exit out, can't I? That appeared there, oh my God, I hate computers. Um, I'm gonna read this. For, uh, I don't usually like to read my slides, but I'm going to in this case. This is a quote from James M. Crafts, who wrote the, the big history of Whateley that went through 1899. He said, our first settlers were all farmers, industriously stirring Mother Earth to induce the best and richest returns in exchange for their tireless labor and watchful care. And my next picture is just a beautiful old picture of a Whateley farm with all of its barns and uh, just, you know, invoking that wonderful agricultural past. And you can't actually see all of the manure and things that were really there. So the way I started this was that I discovered that, that for Whateley there were two agricultural census schedules. These were done in addition to the population census schedules that were done every 10 years. And these were only done for a limited number of towns. And for example, I looked for Williamsburg and they don't have it. So we're very lucky to have this. They also did it for, nine, for 1880, but that was further away than I wanted to go. And really comparing in two years, I mean, te two censuses 10 years apart is more useful. But I'm gonna go back even earlier to the, Whateley was part of Hatfield, as I'm sure you all know, and didn't separate out until 1771. And the way that Hatfield was originally laid out, it was, the system was called a nucleated village. And the, the people who lived in the village had a house lot in the center of town, and they were also given small strips of land in the various divisions. Hatfield had divided what they called the commons, which was the common land. They divided it four times. And Waitley is composed of the second and fourth divisions of Hatfield. This map is of Deerfield, and it just is here to show you how narrow those strips were. There is no similar map for either Whateley or Hatfield, although I'm sure it existed at one time. So these weren't great for farms. They were useful because the person in the house lot would have some wood lot and some meadow lot and some crop, crop lot and even some swamp land, but they, would, they weren't adjacent to their house in any way. And it was impossible really to build a farm. Out of, you can see I've calculated the rods and feet showing you how narrow these were. Now, just so you can imagine it, the roads in Waitley were laid out to be 10 rods. That's 165 feet. That's not very much, really, when you think of it. And you can also notice here the difference between what some people got. And the richer you were, the bigger your slice. So if you look at Nathaniel Dickinson, senior and junior, you can see that senior got just in this one division, 
he got 362 feet and his son got 104 feet. So there, there, there was a big difference, but it was only after some years went by and you could start to put a farm together and that's when later buyers came in, the original proprietors had died or whatever they were willing to sell. So this is what Edward, part of what Edward Brown did. He bought a lot of land in West Waitley. You can see it was over a period of years. And this is not every purchase he made, it's just what I pulled out to show you how it worked. And you can see the dates and you can see the lots that were in the deeds. And even, even the last <coughs> one down, he bought parts of four lots in order and put these together. And so then when you did this process, and if you look at the early deeds for Whateley, they are very much like this. Everybody was trying to put together the kind of farm that then would have lots and lots of acres that they could get a subsistence living on, or more than subsistence in some cases. <coughs> Now the census, the agricultural census covered, it said anyone who resided on or had possession of a farm, whether they were the owner, agent, or tenant, but in Whateley they were virtually all owners. All. In 1850 there were 140 farms enumerated and fewer in 1860, which may have to do with uh, people moving west to a certain extent. There were a lot of people who did leave Whateley. <coughs> The first question that was asked, or the first three questions that were asked for each person, and I, I'm going to break in just for a minute here and tell you that copies of the original census are on the back table, copies that I put into a database in the original order, and copies in alphabetical order so that you can look and see who was in that census. There's also a breakdown of the population <coughs> census so that everybody who's on the agricultural census is listed in the population census back on the table and a couple other things. And Jane very nicely made a big, beautiful blow up of this Swately map that I could never read the names on before. So, so they asked for how many acres were improved and how many were unimproved and then asked for the cash value of the farm. And right away, that enabled me to realize who were the richest, at least by land value, and that doesn't necessarily mean everything, but you, these are the five richest people in Whateley, and it's the, the 1850 value, and then in the top two, it's the 1860 value. The bottom three all died in that 10 year period, and those are the ages that they died. So those men do not appear again in 1860. But I have got the, the 1860, oh this is the farms under a, th under a thousand, that were valued at under a thousand. These are the smallest farms. Um, sometimes it's mystifying because for example, if you look at Arnold Morton, had 170 acres, but it was valued at four hundred dollars, and uh, you know it's it's I, I just haven't taken the time or have maybe have no way to figure out why it turned out that way. After they asked for land improved, unimproved, and improved was basically land that you could grow crops on or build a building on, and unimproved was land that you had done nothing with. Then they they, they moved into a series of questions about what livestock you owned. And it's, I think, very thrilling to think that you can look back at someone in 1850 and know exactly how many animals they had. That, I find that very exciting. These were the animals they wanted to know about. And this is the order that they were asked. Horses, asses and mules, milch cows, which is what milk cows were called then, working oxen, other cattle, which was anything that wasn't a milk cow or an oxen, <laughs> um, sheep, swine, and then they asked for the value of livestock. Not chickens. Not, they didn't ask about chickens, but I am sure that everybody in Whateley had chickens, I, that, but they did not ask that. There were not any big herds of milk cows in Whateley. Whateley had been an area, like a lot of places here, where people fattened or farmers fattened beef and in the beginning actually drove them to Boston by foot for sale. 
and it was a big deal. There's a, there's a book back there also I didn't mention before about Franklin County, and he talks about this business of fattening. They would fatten 100 cows and drive them to Boston on foot. And eventually then the train came in, and, and, and they also stopped doing so much of that here. There were, once the train came in, they could do cattle in other places that weren't so near to Boston, and so it was no longer such a thing in, in, um, in Whateley. But this, so people had two, three, or four cows mostly. Sometimes there were more than that. And I'm going to talk about butter lately and, uh, later, and that really has to do with cows as well. Chester Brown, who you may remember, was, had, had the most valuable farm, also had the most cows. The horse was very important. Virtually, I said, it's only 16 of 140 farms did not have a horse. Most farms had one or two. Benjamin Dane had seven, and the Alice's and Chester Brown had four each. I, in Whateley, we own a, an account book for a man named Zabina Bartlett, who also happens to be on the agricultural census. But he kept accounts of everything, and one of the things that he noted in his accounts was when he rented his horse to people, would borrow his horse to, you know, so-and-so took my horse to Greenfield, so-and-so rode my horse, and he would get a little bit of money for that. He didn't just lend his horse for nothing. So I suppose that's what the people did who didn't have a horse. They borrowed one from someone else. Getting my mouse down here on this thing is not easy. Um, Hmm, it looks familiar. This is not a picture from that time, but it was a great picture, and it shows the way horses were used for agriculture. This picture um, is thanks to Judy, and it's bringing in tobacco. Uh-oh. Then oxen. Nearly every farmer in Whaley used oxen or, or a horse, and many had both, but they asked about mules, and mules were really important in Massachusetts, I mean, in, in the country, but no mules, zero mules were noted on that census. But we found a picture, and I have it here, at the, this picture, it looks to us like those are mules. Those ears sticking up, do you see the difference between the big sticky up ears? That's one of the way, one of the things about mules, and so, and of course, this picture is not 1850, it's, it's later. But it's still at a time when they were using animals to, to, for their agricultural business. Sheep. There were not very many sheep left in, in Whateley by that time. There was, as I say, there was one flock of 100. Sheep had been huge, huge. It was called sheep fever. And, and the whole, when you look at old, old pictures of this area, any of the towns, you'll see that there are no trees. And that's because they really were running sheep on all of those farms. But things happened and, and sheep fever ended. So you see there were really very few flocks of sheep and they were mostly small. Okay, next it moved on to produce. And I've, I'm going to read it here. Uh, wheat in bushels, rye in bushels, Indian corn in bushels, oats in bushels, tobacco in pounds, wool in pounds, Irish potato in bushels, and barley in bushels, and then other farm products. Um, garden produce, which virtually nobody filled in in that census, butter in pounds, cheese in pounds, hay in, in tons, clover seed in bushel, and maple sugar in pounds. Potatoes were, and still are, very big in Whateley. Of, in 1840, only two farmers did not grow potatoes. They made a distinction on there between Irish potatoes and sweet potatoes, but nobody in Whateley grew sweet potatoes. But tobacco is really interesting, and I hope we learn more about tobacco. I've actually learned a lot about tobacco since I started looking at this. This is a very beautiful modern picture of tobacco hanging in the Morton barn that Judy gave to me. But in 1850, these were the people growing tobacco. There were eight, and this tells you how much tobacco they were growing. 
It's not very much. Tobacco had been, has been grown here since the very earliest times. People sometimes grew it <coughs> for their own use and sometimes sold it. But Ina Kane has a nice story in the Whateley book, and it's about the fact that around the 1850s, around this time, the local ministers, not, not just Whateley, but all of the ministers, got together and decided that the farmers should be discouraged from growing tobacco because smoking was a vice and you didn't want to be growing something that enabled a vice. And so they came to the Whateley minister and asked him if he would encourage the farmers in Whateley not to grow tobacco. And he said, I don't mind much what they're raising as long as they raise my salary. <laughs> 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 so here we're, now we're comparing 1850 and 1860. So there were eight farms growing tobacco in 1850, and in 1860 there were 22 farms not growing tobacco. It was a massive difference. And when you look at the improved versus unimproved land for people, most of that, I think a lot of the land that they improved was so that they could grow tobacco. And this is just another really nice picture. It's 1895, it has a date right on it. And it's again, still using horses though, and doing something called setting tobacco, which I assume means either seeding or planting. planting. I actually planting. work, planting. what does it mean? Planting, planting little plants. Okay. Seeding. The whole tobacco, I really hope he does talk to us because I was astonished at how expensive it is actually to grow tobacco and how much care it takes and how many things can go wrong with it. Okay, butter. Butter was huge in weight. I don't know where all this butter was going, but they were, everybody was making butter. And when they made it, I mean, and I, I, I correlated the cows and the butter, which makes no sense. For Oren Dickinson, for example, had two cows that made a thousand pounds of butter. He must have been, I, I can only figure, and it's pure speculation, that he was getting milk from other people in order to make, and Oren Dickinson is one of the families, one of the men or families that I'm going to be focusing on in the second part of this talk. Chester Brown made 1,200 pounds of butter and 1,200 pounds of cheese. So, and other people made cheese, but usually in smaller quantities, 30, 40 pounds. This was one place where, for sure, I think the women were playing a big part in this because I don't think there were men churning butter and Whateley somehow. Kids. This was, these are the things I said not in Whateley. Nobody made wine, raised silkworms, rotted hemp, or raised flax. Nobody raised sweet potatoes, cotton, or cane sugar. Those were all things asked for on this agricultural census, and of course, would have been a much bigger deal in other parts of the country. I should just hang on to this, and then I would have to fool around with it every day. But things where there were things not mentioned in the agricultural census, which were very big in Whateley, and one of them was brooms. So uh, there were, there were, Waitley, in fact, led the broom-making towns, and there are charts and statistics in the back of, uh, in Garrison's, Garrison Ritchie's, whatever his name was, Ritchie Garrison's book. But these are the figures. In 1845, Waitley produced 160,000 brooms, and they were, Waitley was the leader in broom production. And one of the interesting things about Waitley was that they made the handles and grew the broom corn. Most, the upland towns, the Asheville, the hill towns, what we call the hill towns now, were often made the handles but didn't grow the broom corn. And, but Whateley did both and was able to put them together. Oh. Because of Westbrook. Excuse me? Because of Westbrook. Westbrook. Oh. The mill. Yes. The mill of I'm sorry, I, 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 I'm deaf as a post, so I can never hear anything that anybody says to me. Uh, we should, I'm sorry, Don. These were the broom makers, the chief broom makers. And on the, oh, another thing that's someplace here, I discovered by accident, is that there was also a manufacturing census 
for Whateley. It only runs to two pages, uh, but it does tell you what was what was made in Whateley that wasn't things that were not included on the agricultural census. And then the big surprising one, when I was looking at the census, I kept finding all these people that said they were wallet makers. And I didn't understand that at all. And I didn't understand how many, this is a, a picture I just dragged off the internet, what, what is supposed to be an old wallet. And you can see the stitching on the sides of it. There were, there were factories in Whateley who, with men who made wallets. It's written up quite nicely in Kraft's book. And he said that they, the, um, the factories employed five to seven men and perhaps a dozen women. But the interesting part is after the leather was cut and prepared and pasted, pa what they pasted, I have no idea, I'm just telling you what I read. It went into homes all around Whateley, as many as 60 homes, Kraft says, and there people put the stitching in, you did it in your home as piecework, and then you were paid, not in money, but in credit at the store. Huh. And uh, so this was, it's, I, have, I think my next slide is who, who were the wallet makers in Whateley? Yes. So it was, a, it was a, and it said that they made thousands and thousands of wallets, and I suppose not only wallets, but different kinds of leather pouches and billfolds and, uh, you know, a, some early form of briefcase. And then, I'm not going to say anything about this because we all know about Waitley, but, but of course there was pottery and I had to throw a, a pottery piece in just just to have it there. Okay, I'm now ready to tell my stories about people. And I don't really have pictures. I have, I've, I have talked about individual families. We can turn the light back on. Um, I, I have a couple, I have a picture of some barns and, and things like that. But when I talk about these families, I want you to try to think about what those farms really looked like with the chickens and the gardens and the corn cribs and the fences and the manure piles and all the hustle and bustle of a farm in 1850. They didn't look as nice and neat as they do now. But I'm, I'm focusing on four particular families and what happened to them. And the first one is Oliver Morton. and the. The Oliver Morton Barnes are the big yellow ones that are still here in town. He was born about 1777, and he died in 1844, so he's not actually in this census. Uh, he, he died of dropsy, which we now call a congestive heart failure, basically. And when I was looking at these people, I looked at the wills. They're available online, and they are fascinating, in my opinion. Uh, and they tell you what happened to their, their real estate property and the other property that they had. So Oliver Morton's wife's name was Nancy, and he left her the use and improvement of one third of his property. He gave her all his furniture. Mm -hmm. And to his daughters, he left $5 each. To his son Oliver, Jr., who was the oldest of his children, he forgave two promissory notes. <laughs> To his son, John Lyman Morton, who actually continued living in Whateley and is enumerated in the census, he left $50. And to his son, Levi Parsons, who was not yet 21, he left everything else. Well, it turned out that his debts were such that Levi Parsons Morton, when he turned 21, got nothing because the property was sold to pay his debts. So Levi Parsons Morton, became a chiropodist, which turns out to be uh, like a podiatrist. And maybe there are some distinctions. If you're one of them, you think it's not exactly the same as the other one. But he, he, when he was 41 years old, he married, he moved to Northampton, and he was a chiropodist. So he, was, he had nothing to do with Waitley anymore. The oldest son, Oliver, the one whose promissory notes had been forgiven, was already had moved to Ohio. And in two weeks after his father died, he, pay, he signed a deed paying his brother, John Lyman Morton, 
$100 for his right, or he, he took $100 for his right in the land. So John, John Morton Lyman, who has a different house actually, yeah, and it's, you should tell them that we call that the Waite House. Which one? You should, isn't that the Waite? Yeah, Wait. the Howard Waite. So oh, yeah. are currently, we don't know who those Mortons are. So right. it's a, the Howard Waite farm. D that, not this one, but that. The, yeah. Oh, oh this is, I forgot to tell you about this. This is so wonderful. I found this. I, I don't know if you know what an earmark is, but an earmark is what they did to their cattle in order to identify them. So in Oliver Morton, on the back page, on the back table is the sheet of earmarks for Whateley. They cropped both ears. He cropped both ears and then a slit, one slit in one side and two slits in the other. And everybody did a different thing to their animal's ears so that then when they were wandering around loose, you knew whose it was. More than that, though. What? It was more than that, that they, the earmarks also meant uh, breeding and other things what, so they could follow the line and that sort of thing, so they could get very complicated. Oh gosh, uh, you know more than I do about earmarks. I read it in our school. So, yeah, I don't know, I think I should take this mouse out and just use the damn... There. Okay, this is, this is John Lyman Morton's house, and this house is right there on the main street of Whateley as well. Right? So he, his wife was named Clarissa. They had two young children, and in 1850 he was living with his mother, who of course was widowed at that time, his wife, and two unrelated persons. And one of the things that you see very clearly when you look at the 1850 population census is that many, many people in Whateley had unrelated people living in their household. They were very often 18, 19, 20 years old, they came from Ireland, they came from Canada, and they were obviously hired to help on these farms. So John Morton was living with two of these people, and he had 42 acres improved and 17 unimproved, and the farm was valued at $2,400. He had one horse, one cow, four oxen, three other cattle, and two pigs. He raised rye, corn, and oats, and produced 300 pounds of cheese. Like his father, however, his story is illustrative of the fact that not all in Whateley prospered. In, 19, in 1850, the same year the census was done, he mortgaged his land to Smith Charities for, he, for $900 payable in four years. But two years later, he sold the same property to a man named Lauren Hayden, and the, the mortgage was cited in that. He, so he moved to Heath, then he moved to Greenfield, and then he died when he was 51 years old. He died of cancer of the stomach. So that's, that was what happened to that family. I'm going to see whose house is next. OK, Charlotte Bardwell. I, I was particularly interested in the very, very few women who were counted, I don't need it, who were counted in this census. And so I looked to see what the story was with two of the women. One of them is Charlotte Bardwell and the other one was named Judith Dickinson. Charlotte Bardwell was born in Stafford, Connecticut in 1787. She was the second wife of Charles Bardwell. Charles Bardwell was the fifth of 15 children born to Lieutenant Noah Bardwell in West Whateley. <laughs> a lot of those children died and there's a big row of them up in the West Whateley Cemetery. He was born in 1776, so he was, he was a good bit older than Charlotte. Um, in, he, married, he married for the first time in 1806, but his wife died. His father, in 1806, his father gave him, and this was what he, the, this is the wording in the deed. He said, in consideration of natural affection, love, and goodwill, he gave him a part of the farm on which I reside. Now that Noah Bardwell house is not in West Whateley and I can't really picture from the descriptions I've read of it where it was, but it was somewhere right there in the middle of the whole thing. So his wife died in 1817 and two years later he married Charlotte. Now she was from Stafford, Connecticut. All four of his children married people from Stafford, Connecticut. And I don't, and apparently he went down there for a while. He must have, because otherwise 
why would they have had so many connections? But Charlotte and Charles had no children at all themselves, and he died in 1845, by which time, of course, he was not in this census either. He <laughs> left legacies of $100 to each of his daughters and smaller, smaller legacies to grandchildren, and he left his estate to his son, Lincoln Bardwell, who actually never lived in Whiteley, but all married a Stafford person and lived in Stafford. <laughs> But it was in this way that Charlotte, now 63 years old, was the only female farmer in Whateley in 1850. She reported acreage of 27 improved and seven unimproved acres with a cash value of $1,000. She had two cows and three other cattle, but no horse, oxen, sheep, or pigs. She raised 25 bushels of corn and 75 bushels of potatoes. She made 300 pounds of butter and 100 pounds of cheese. Now she lived with her daughter-in-law, Amanda, who was the, the, why was she? I'm confused about what I'm talking about. She, she lived with nobody. She had nobody left. She lived with a girl named Clarissa Jewett who was 16 years old. In 1852, she sold for $400 to her stepson, Lincoln, half of her house. And I'm going to read the precise wording because I see deeds like this all the time and I think they are so interesting. This is what she gave, this is what he got. The southeast lower room of the house, lately owned by Lieutenant Noah Bardwell, also the bedroom, buttery, and sink room east of the said lower room. Also the chamber over the said southeast room together with one half of the privilege of the south entryway and stairs and also his share of privilege in the wood yard and front yard. So they, these in probates you see this a lot because it was a way of protecting a widow either from stepchildren or of enabling her, who usually had the right to stay in the house until her death, it was so that whoever it was couldn't say to her, well, you can't, you have your room, but you can't go here, there, and the other place. And they were extremely careful to, to draw this out in deeds. And in fact, in one of the deeds, these were children of uh, another West Whateley man named Isaiah Brown. Isaiah Brown had a son named Isaiah Brown who was killed by a slow sled of wood turning over and, and left his wife with three little children, twins and another little child. Well, later, one of those children sold, I think she must have been the heir, she sold to her brother and sister parts of the house written down to the inch. They got nine inches, so many feet and nine inches of the room. So it was, that was, I've never seen one that actually <coughs> divided a room by inches, but it was pretty interesting. And I said, it sounds very strange to our ears that you would do this to a house, but you will find them all over the place. But there's another wrinkle to all of this because Right away, Lincoln turned around and sold this same exact land to Lucinda Bardwell and Cotton Munson. Now, Lucinda Bardwell was part of this set of twins, Lucinda and Aminda. And they were so identical that their father brought, bought them beaded necklaces, one strand and two strands, so they could be told apart. They dressed identically throughout their lives, and when Aminda got married, Lucinda went with her. She married Joel Munson, and they both went to live with Joel Munson. We have pictures of them at the Historical Society, and you can see the beads. And they dress, they are, this, these pictures were taken when they were very old, and they still were dressed identical. And you can sort of tell a tiny bit of difference between them, but not much. So when, Lois Bean's da oldest daughter has a necklace, a necklace yeah. because they are related to the same right. beads. So that, well, the strand of bead, beads still exists. It exists, yes. <laughs> I thought that, I pictured them as long strings of beads, but they were tight around the neck, so when you saw them in the portrait, you could see whatever they had on, you could see the beads. Well, Amanda's husband died, and his heir was Cotton, his son Cotton Munson, and at that point, there was a flurry of deeds because Lucinda had to buy the room that she lived in. 
from her son, her, her nephew it was, I guess. And this business here, which I, I haven't untangled because it could take weeks of research to look at all those deeds. I know this all happened because I confused that Lucinda Bardwell with, with mm -hmm. another Lucinda Bardwell who also lived in West Whateley at the same time. But that, that is, so at that point, Charlotte Bardwell has nothing left. And when she died, which was just a year later, she left a will, which I also love, and she didn't have property. So these are the things that she left, and she named all of her, I guess, her most precious things. Her gold, bead, her gold beads, her black silk dress, her black silk shawl, her black silk cloak, her black lace mantilla, silver spoons, and a large gilt-framed looking glass. Mm -hmm. And she named each of the friends who would get these things. So that was Charlotte Bardwell's story, the only woman to be, to be itemized in 1850. Next I have, look at I have a T in, long, in the, the uh, chestnut plaint. <laughs> Judith Dickinson, this, this is another just, and again, I, I, I really hope you can try to use your imagination to frame as much as possible what life was like for these families back then. Judith Dickinson was, was the wife of Oliver Dickinson. He was a son of Samuel Dickinson, and I'm not, I could go back all the way back, but we don't need to know that for this point. Erica, is that yeah. the Byron Canny house? I think it is the Byron Candy House, so yes. I think people want to yes. identify yes. with what it is. I'm not good at knowing what's where, and I was going to ride around with you and look at houses, but we never got time to do it. There are so many wonderful houses. I, I would like to really know more about who, live, Actually, who lives Ed now. Ed in, Bardo, Byron grew yeah. up there, but that, he lived in the South. Okay. Anyway, this is, this is the house, and the house next door was also related because it was two brothers who never married, and uh, were were they were, I think they were nephews of Oliver. Oliver Oliver um, got married when he was 26 years old to Judith, and uh, she was a Scot, and she was about 18 years old, and they had three children. They lived this house the way the deeds make it look. It was in the Claverack area, but you may know more than well, I do. Claverack's just down the hill. Okay. It's hard to tell from the old deeds exactly where places were because they still do things like saying starting at a white birch and you know all of that and it just doesn't help or us. Or a stone wall. That's no yeah, stone there. wall and even the stake and stones which might still be there, how are you going to know, you know? I wish they had land drawings and you know, it, but I've tried buying software to figure out land shapes and I just can't do it. So the, they had three, three children, okay? In they, the one son was named Dwight. He was a, a had consumption. He made his will in 1844, and although his parents were both alive, his father, I believe, was already sick. His father died of <coughs> congestive heart failure, and it had probably been a condition going on for some time. So Dwight knew that he was dying, and he made his will and left his land to his mother. Then they, he, but in the meantime, the sister, Mary Ann, also died of consumption. So she, neither one of them had ever married. So there was one brother left, his name was Oren, and he had moved to Ohio. He was the one with the wife, Amanda, that I got confused about a minute ago. So when his brother Dwight died, he knew that his father was sick, that there was nobody there to run the farm, and he came back to Whateley to run the farm for his parents. Oliver, the father, died of what they called in the death record numb palsy, which could have been either paralysis from a stroke or Bell's palsy, but Bell's palsy doesn't really kill you, at least not in, as I know, so I'm thinking it may have been more of a paralysis from a stroke than actually Bell's palsy. But Oren is the one who is listed in the census, not his father, even though his father was still alive. So the farm, that farm, was six, 
60 acres improved and 25 unimproved and was valued at $3,500. They had one horse, two cows, two oxen, five other cattle, and one pig. He reported producing 10 bushels of rye, 20 bushels of corn, and 40 tons of hay, but also 1,000 pounds of butter. And you saw that before when I showed you the butter uh, slide. Uh, how he made that much butter, I don't know. Uh, but you know, uh, maybe Judith and Amanda working together were able to do it. So in 1852, Oliver died, and then she sold Judith, who had inherited land from her son and from her husband, sold all of her land to Oren, her <coughs> remaining son. So she had nothing. But then in 1856, Oren died, also of consumption. So all three of her children died of consumption. Her husband had died of this palsy. He had made his, days, his will just a few days earlier, and I always have a little heartbreak when I read these wills that are made three or four days before someone dies, because of course that means that they knew that death was imminent. And that seems sad to me even now. But Amanda and her children continued to live in the family farm with Judith. And then Judith, who was 70 years old, became the farmer, the one who was listed in the census, which is why I'm talking about her. There were, I think, three women in 1860, one in 1850, three, but I, I can't stand here and talk all night, so I didn't, I didn't go on to the others. But the farm looked much the same as it had 10 years earlier. She reported 85 acres of improved land and five acres unimproved. This is the same total of land as before, but she improved, or somebody had improved, 25 additional acres. She reported the value at $2,500, which was $1,000 less than, than 10 years earlier. She had one horse, four cows, one other cattle, and two pigs, but no working oxen. This suggests that she was hiring help for her crops because she continued to produce rye and corn and in that year reported 1,100 pounds of tobacco. So that was the first year she was growing or that <coughs> farm was growing tobacco. She also produced much less butter than before. She produced 300 pounds, whereas it had been 1,000 pounds before. But she improves, uh, produced 100 pounds of cheese compared to no cheese in 1850. Uh, there's no agricultural census for 1870, so we can't tell what happened to her, but she died in 1871. And so that, then Amanda owned the farm, and I didn't follow what happened to Amanda. The last of all that I did is Elliot Alice, and I did this because he's a direct ancestor of Adelia Alice Bardwell and Don Sluter, both sitting here in this audience. So he, his farm was up on Dickinson Hill Road, or the road that used to go to Mount Esther, and he was born in Conway in 1816, and he and all his family are buried in the South Park Cemetery, which is this, if you walk the old road, which I am determined to do one of these but haven't done yet, if you walk the old road that continues from Mount Esther or Dickinson Hill Road, it goes right up to the South Park Cemetery. And it's not really terribly far. I mean, it's a matter of a few miles. Roaring Brook. If you tell them that it comes out Right, it comes out of Roaring Brook. But the South, Roaring Brook, Roaring Brook splits right where that stone castle is. And the one part is Roaring Brook, and the other part it's called South Park, and I don't know where, but that's where that cemetery is, and it's called the South Park Cemetery. Elliot Alice was the son of Solomon Alice, and as I mentioned, he's related to people in this room. In 1850, he reported 90 acres improved and 40 unimproved, and in 1860, a lot more than that, and why I didn't put the amount, I don't know, but he married twice, but his five children were all born to his first wife, whose name was Elvira, and she was the daughter of Daniel and Polly Scott Dickinson. By 1850, at the time of the agricultural census, he was in his mid-30s and had four young children. His farm was worth $3,500. 
He had one horse, six cows, two oxen, three other cattle, and one pig. He raised corn and one of the very few farmers in Whateley who raised oats. Like every other farmer, he raised Irish potatoes and he also raised apples. Not very many people, they called it orchard products, but I think in, in here it was mainly apples. There was a lot of apple brandy made in Whateley, apparently. They made a lot of butter and cheese, 900 pounds of butter and 600 pounds of cheese. And in addition, he was making maple syrup. There were very few people making maple syrup in, in those early years, although I, there were others, but very few. So he had, as I mentioned, five children, and this is what happened to him. His son Henry was born in 1855, this is between the two censuses, and died when he was nine months old of cholera. Oh. This was a big killer of children. His wife died in 1861 of a disease of the bowels, whatever that meant. Two weeks later, his daughter dies of epilepsy. Two, a wife and a daughter in two weeks. His other daughter got married and moved out. Her name was Angeline. His son was named Lucius, and he was a Civil War soldier killed in action. So he's left alone with the one son, Irving, who's the, the way the line comes down. In the meantime, oh, I did say how much his acreage was. In the meantime, he was becoming an affluent man. His acreage increased a great deal from 9040 to 230 10. That's 230 improved and 10 unimproved. And his farm was valued at $6,000. He had one horse, seven cows, two oxen, six other cattle, one pig, and 18 sheep. He, switch, he produced wheat and corn, but had switched from oats to tobacco, which he, which he reported at 6,300 pounds. He stayed with potatoes and apples, and his butter and cheese production dropped, and I'm speculating it's because there were fewer women in the household. And he also stopped making syrup. He died in 1874, and unusually for Whateley, there's no death record. There's almost always a death record that tells who the parents were and what the cause of death was. His death was noted in church records, and it only had a date. It didn't say why, so I have no idea why he died. Um, but he left a lot of money. He left $3,500 to be invested for his second wife, whose name was Cornelia, and $1,000 to be invested for his daughter, Angeline. He left money for his granddaughters, who were named Hattie and Alice. He left 500 in trust for the Whateley Congregational Church, and he stipulated that it was to be used for music, music yeah. and for books, religious books. He left small legacies to a long list of individuals, and I, I printed them out. It was a lot of people that he left $100 to live various places. And finally, to Irving, he left his farm, his farming tools, my stock of horses, cattle, sheep, and swine, and all my crops harvested and unharvested. And I said about his house, his house is both lost and not lost because it has been disassembled <coughs> and stored in a barn in New Hampshire, but it exists. And theoretically, if someone had the money to do it, it could be reassembled in Whateley or elsewhere and would still exist. I do have, I thought I had, maybe I, I, I messed around with this. I got into who other people were. Oh, there's the picture of the Alice, the Alice barn. And it's still, I just drove up there and looked at it. And this is still the, the configuration of this place. But it was bought by the Ninja Turtle Man, has been made very, very beautiful. And Delia says it, that he has many, many beautiful motorcycles. He's gotten and, rid of a lot of them. Oh, he, one time he had 300 or some or collection of motorcycles. Dozens of them. Yeah. And I said the floor is like you can eat off them. It's just a beautiful, what was the yeah. lower cellar where you had pigs and stuff. It's, he just made it beautiful. Yeah, it doesn't, it, I'm sure there's no, there's no manure piles there now. <laughs> <laughs> So I'm done, even though that slide is there. I could talk more about who, did, who were the blacksmiths, and, but I think I've talked about <coughs> enough. Um, I but I want to take questions, yes. I want to correct something, because I've always been told, I don't know if you've heard the story, Don, that he left in his will the property to the children 
of Irving. Irving and his wife had gone west, and they wanted to settle out in the west. And when they got word that Elliot had died, they had to come back in order to save that property. Am I right, John? That's, that's what that's to, I read it, but I don't, I don't I think remember I that, have but I'll look at it again. I, I'll bring I, I copied one piece. This is the piece where he gave the legacies away, mm -hmm. and he lists some of them. Um, to this woman of Danvers, Illinois, he gave $500. To somebody in Ashfield, Mass, 200 To Elliot Alice, he gave 500 To Frank Alice, 100 Mary Alice, 100 then he names Paulina, Harriet, Mary, Mrs. Marianne Fields, Mrs. Adelaide Tinkham, Eveline Alice, Sylvia Parmalee, et cetera, et cetera. This is, there are a lot of bits and pieces on the back if anyone wants to look at these. And this wonderful, you've probably all seen this map of Whateley, which is really it, too small to read, but thank you, Jane. She made a beautiful big, we can use this a lot. Um, it's a little later than the period that I'm talking about, but still some of the, some of the names are still the same. Uh, it was a pretty fluid place in pe terms of people moving around. Uh, and, and how many descendants of original Waitley families really are there left in Waitley? Well, I have More to tell the people who went to school, you had Mrs. Hall. Angelina, Angelina was oh. the, the Alice that married the Hall in Asheville. And she was the teacher mm -hmm. that we had here in Waitley. And right. she used to have her thermos jug. Mm -hmm. And we all thought she was drinking, you know, whatever. And she got fired. <laughs> oh, you thought she was drinking water? Right, right. She had her thermos. She was the principal. <laughs> sister, she <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, right. Yeah, she gave me a ride home one day. <laughs> so I, I, I would like to take questions. I've talked for almost an hour. <laughs> You mentioned a long list, a surprisingly long list of crops that they grew. Which were the principal cash crops, do you know? I think, I, I think tobacco was definitely a cash crop. I think potatoes had to be a cash crop because there were so many of them grown. Uh, uh, some crops I didn't mention, there were three people who grew barley, only three, and they were all grades. They were, and they must have, some one brother started with barley and then they all like barley. But I don't know, you know, I don't, I don't know as much as I should to answer your question in terms of what they really sold, the tobacco for sure. And of course, the, they, one of the questions that they asked was value of animals slaughtered. So I assume that they, I don't know if they slaughtered animals as, for cash or, but the butter I'm sure they made for, crap, for cash. You can't eat 1,200 pounds of butter in one family, at least most families that I know of. So our family took the butter to Holyoke. To Holyoke, okay. And sold it in stores. You, you talk. An, another piece of that butter, Sonny, Sonny Scott has a diary from a Crafts family from 1885. He was driving up to Conway to deliver butter. To and he also sold it up at the, the general store where the Waitley Inn is now. Uh -huh. So, I mean, the idea of going from North Street to Conway to sell, yeah. I mean, he would ride his horse up there to, 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 to deliver to butter to be yeah. sold. Uh, the, uh, the, the distances people rode on horses, I mean, up to Greenfield for this and that, all, you know, just from that, that a Zabina Bartlett book, you could tell that they were always riding, riding various places. You talked about manufacturing in Whaley. <clears throat> I can remember, well, when I was real small, that there was a rope factory in Dad's yard. Yes. They used to make clothesline ropes. Yes. And we have, it was later, that was Lyman Sanderson who made, he made clothesline rope and dish mops. Yeah. And the, the, they, he made the, he turned the handles and made the, and, and, uh, Fishing line, also, I think. Well, the, but some of the buildings were still there when I was small, and then of course Dad tore them down. But, right. Because they were falling down. But I can remember some of the buildings there in the yard. Yeah. Well, there was so much manufacturing in West Whateley before the reservoir went in, because it, was it a mill on yeah, the it took mill. the water away, and there was you know no more. But I mean, there were things that I don't even understand, like an oil mill, which must have been pressing some kind of crop pressing to get seeds. what pressing seeds 
I know, but what? What seeds? They were, there was, and there were, they, you know, they were making shoes and there were tanners and, you know, uh, mills, various mills. It's very interesting. Ina Kane's book and James Craft's book both talk a lot about the manufacturing and Westbrook was famous because it had so many rights or whatever they call it, privileges on there. Yeah, and I, another thing I'd like to do is Fred Bardwell did a VHS tape about the mills on the West Brook, but it's on a VHS tape. We can get that. And I need to, yes, one of the things I wanted to do is to get, because I'd like to know more about that as well. <coughs> so. There's still a number of foundations on West Brook. Yes, there, there are. Yeah, now I kept re seeing these things about the Glen, 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 Whaley Glen, and I didn't understand that the, this is the South Deerfield Reservoir that changed Whaley Glen, too. I don't know, I, there wasn't so much manufacturing there, but it was, it was a pleasure area with swimming in a waterfall. Derek, who was the brown farm? Who's what? A brown farm. Where was the brown farm? Where? 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 Ask Adelia. I think that was the Grover's. Oh, sure, I know that. Where? Of course, of course I know that. That was William Austin Brown, and that's the house that the Judsons lived in when we were young. It's right there at the top of the hill. Uh, if, you, if you come over the brook, you've come down Poplar Hill, you go over the brook and up, and, and it's right there at the top. It still looks very much the same as it used to. Who was the, the author that lived there? Uh, Kennedy lived there. Well, Artist Judson worked for McLeish. Carlos Kennedy lived there. Oh, Carlos Kennedy, yes. Yeah. But they bought it from the Grovers. Oh. Yeah. And Carlos Grovers. Kennedy owned it before the Judsons. Yes. Right. right. And she, oh, she worked for Archibald McLeish. Jeanette. Artist. No, 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 Artist Judson. Yes, Artist Judson worked for work. And her daughter is still in that house. Yeah. Right. That, that, he was the son of Daniel Brown, who lived, who I thought lived. Yeah. Where the Terran, where the Nancy Tulanian lives, but it turned out that I did very long time of research only to discover that I was totally wrong. So he, he actually lived where the across from where Bill Obear has his house now, and I I had I got it confused, and I don't know. The Whateley book says that Isaiah Brown built the Tulanian house where the strips lived when we were kids, remember? Mm -hmm. Ted right next door. Yeah. And the book says that Isaiah Brown built that house, but he didn't. So the, the mattress site, if, if you are computer, if you're happy and familiar with your computer, most of these pictures came off the mattress site, which lists the Whiteley houses. It's the what does MACRA stand for? Massachusetts? Massachusetts uh, it's, it's the Mass Historical Commission Historical Inventory Site. And site. They, and so it, has, it has 16 pages of, of Whateley buildings, although there are not pictures for every one. But if you live in a building older than 1900, chances are you can go in there and punch in your address. It's M-A-C-R-I-S. MACRA. Um, it's a, there's a link to it on the Historical Society's resource page. It's, it also, in addition to buildings, it lists sites like the Pound and the Dexter Martin Mill site that's up way up there in the woods behind the reservoir, uh, and and other things. It's a little the milk weird. Bottle, the milk bottle. Excuse me. The milk bottle. And yes. The cemetery. The milk bottle. List the milk bottle and the cemeteries, and. It, it's it's really fun to explore. I think the, that mattress site. Like. The historic state, the historical society, and got a grant along with some other people to inventory a lot of old buildings in town. Mm -hmm. This is, and they are were filed with the state, and the state has put them up online. Wow. And so you can go research your house. You can research your neighbor's house. And, and it includes a lot of the modern, more modern tobacco barns are on there and other things that were built later. So it's not just old houses. You can also find the craft's history on the Historical Society website. So or you can buy it from us. You can buy it. <laughs> but if you're on the website and you want to research uh, Charles Russell, you can, you can do a search for Russell. I mean, 
when you're on the web, you can search for a keyword. So if you want to know about wallets or or pottery or dairy or something, you you can do that. It's it's you you may have to went through a lot of references you don't want to know about, but but they're there. I was thinking about the um, the amount of butter that was made and whether you, and when you owned only two cows, for example. And often farmers did barter amongst themselves, uh, so they would you would give them cream and you were making butter, and then when some, yeah, some you, you had some other product. So very often those kinds of things happened, and so it was not an exact science in right. terms of on paper. Right. But right. Totally. And I'm sure they did it with eggs too. Absolutely. Yeah. Are we done with the other yeah. questions? Yes. yes. I'm just trying to put the farm prices, $2,500 and uh, 2000 and 3000 in context. What was, if you bought a loaf of bread at that time, how much would it cost? It doesn't Ooh, matter. A few cents. I didn't even buy it. Well, you baked it. Made you made a loaf of bread. <laughs> I can't, I don't know, it's well, something I should have something else. So 1940s, what would you buy on an 10 cents. Yeah. Hmm? 1940s, about 10 cents. You paid for a little bit. 1940? Well, I can remember paying yeah, 31 cents a gallon for gas, and yeah. I'm not even old. Do you, have any idea, do you have any idea what the income level for these, uh, or... Well, he's fishing for, for he's yeah. fishing for, for what the, how yeah. that how that related to Cash modern... Value right. Or right. There, was, there was no income tax, so... Nobody would be keeping track of it. The, the, the other thing, this was self-reported, right? Yeah, it yeah. Was, it was, and, and, you know, who knows what it really meant. Which you would well, maybe the cost the of the census today. Sugar, the agricultural right. census today are self-reported. Yeah, yeah. And boy, I'll tell you, it's hard to figure and, out. I mean, could I really tell worth. you how much I did in a year in terms of making something? I, I would have, and I'm sure half of those figures were just made up. They probably actually knew how many are. animals they had. But. <laughs> That's about it. Any other questions?